So let's get going on our panel. Um, we'll start with uh, just maybe having the panelists to introduce themselves, and uh, maybe we'll go from Anne Marie in this corner all the way to the end, and then we'll get going on the questions. Um, I'm Anne Marie Bustani. I'm one of the attendings in the um, nuclear radiology division. I am um, Julia Shapiro. I'm originally from Germany, as you might hear from the accent. I uh, did a PhD here at Yale, I did a postdoctoral fellowship in international radiology at Hopkins, and I'm now an IR resident and research scientist here. And I'm Rob Goodman, I'm a pediatric radiologist, um, moved here 14 years ago, trained in the UK, and I'm now chair of the radiology department. Hello, my name is Regina Hooley, and I've been on faculty here for 18 years. I'm an associate professor, and I'm a breast imager, and I'm also vice chair for clinical affairs. I'm Lisa Kent. I'm an ultrasound attending. I've been here for 16 years. And I am Cicero Silva. I'm originally from Brazil. Did uh, medicine there, radiology there. Did fellowships in uh, Canada and Australia. And I've been here since uh, 10 years ago. I'm from. Uh, I'm also a pediatric radiologist. And you know me, of course, I'm not mather, but uh, what you may not know, I did my med school in McGill, uh, Montreal. Did my residency here, did my fellowship in Boston, been a back here as faculty for five years. And uh, yeah, that's all you need to know about me for the moment. So, what questions do you guys have? So, um, I think one of the biggest um, uh, assets that radiologists have as a specialty, and you may have other preferences, but in my mind, if you think about evolution, it's not the strongest that survive, it's not the most intelligent that survive, it's the most adaptable. And radiology has shown over the past how adaptable it has become, in that development of MRI, development of nuclear medicine, ultrasound now being used for more and more indications. Um, embracing IT, there are no other specialties, I think, that you will ever come across that embrace IT the way that radiology has done. We were the first to use voice recognition for reports. We expedited our turnaround time. We, we took those on board. We worked with them. We have uh, really adapted to what is required. So the question was, what will it look like in the future? I think radiology will adapt in the future to what is required and what's going to be required. There's going to be more accurate diagnoses, more quick fast diagnoses, uh, appropriate use of uh, new developments, um, there's amazing things in the wings, deuterium MRI scanning, looking at brain functionality is, is, is coming out. Um, so adaptability is something that radiology will always do. AI is obviously in the wings as well, and uh, artificial intelligence is something that uh, radiologists are embracing and working on, and we're developing uh, AI research with our industry partners at Yale too. If you're looking way into the future, you know, it's going to be data you can touch. It's going to be putting on your, you know, forget the dark room. We're going to be wearing goggles and touching CT scans and moving things around with our hands. We're going to have um, mobile imaging. Mobile imaging is the way it's going. Instead of going into an MRI scanner and sitting there and having your head scanned, you're going to put on a beanie and uh, it'll beam the MRI scan back to you know, a radiologist who's sitting on the beach with his virtual reality goggles <laughs> uh, dictating that. So um, I think my, my, my answer to you is that uh, we adapt to what is being thrown at us, and the few things that we know about that are in the wings, we are embracing, I would say, more than other specialties. Maybe from the interventional radiology, I'm not sure what you know, you know, around the development. But it's, it's very important to know that uh, those specialties, uh, first of all, IR and diagnostic belong together uh, to two kids in one, in one home. And in IR, there is also rapid development. Um, over the last 15 to 20 years, IR has become a, an equal partner, for example, in cancer therapies, along with uh, surgical oncology, medical oncology, and radiation oncology. There is, uh, two years ago or three years ago, there was a new society, Society of Interventional Oncology founded, and this research is exploding right now, so IR is becoming um, a reliable partner of all other specialties to treat cancer, sometimes at the, it's the first and equal uh, choice in some cancers really now. Um, there is enormous technological development like in no other uh, profession, both in terms of imaging, image guidance technologies, also drug delivery and um, actually drug research that is done by interventional radiologists. So, um, and you know, to, to, to re reiterate the impact of AI, so because radiologists are actually in all medicine leading that research, we are going to likely be the one to, uh, to profit from this the most. 
uh, because there is more, more demand to be more accurate, to do more exams, and also at the same time spend more time with patients, AI will enable us to do just that. It's not uh, so the recent hype around it will not uh, wipe out radiology, it will make it more powerful and more central, will make, will make us data experts for all our specialties. So, yes, following on from, from his question, so artificial intelligence, sure, is going to certainly augment the way we work. So the way that we are seeing artificial intelligence working is that, for example, if Regina um, sees a lesion on a breast mammogram, um, she has to mentally work out where exactly it is in that 3D representation of the breast and write it all down in her report as to where it is. And that's pretty boring and, and mundane. With artificial intelligence, she can put an X on the, on the, on the cancer on the, on the mammogram. And then the AI can say, this is two centimeters from the nipple, three centimeters from the pectoralis major on the left side, uh, in the left upper outer quadrant. And that takes away that mundane component <coughs> of the work and just makes it easier for us. Artificial intelligence can pre-screen a work list. So <coughs> we're doing research at the moment where we're sitting in the ED, um, the AI tool is looking at the CT brains. Um, we're reading the, the, the most, uh, the oldest scan first, but AI can then look at the scans that are actually waiting to be looked at. And if there's a bleed on that scan, it can bump it to the next case to be read. And that's not obviating the radiologist, that's, that's obviating, that's helping the patient's disposition because then the CT scan that's got an abnormality on it gets read next and that patient gets cared for. So that's the sort of way that I see AI working for, for uh, radiologists. I always say this, but for the rest of the population at large, AI is a big problem because you're gonna have your driverless cars, you're gonna go home and Alexa's gonna put on your favorite TV show, <laughs> something's gonna appear in front of you. Everyone's going to get demented because they're not using their muscle memory. But radiology has imaging for dementia, so we'll always be in business. <laughs> <laughs> you know, way back when, um, like in the 70s, when we were just talking about computers, people thought there was going to be no more paper. Like the paper industry was just going to tank, and we would never be printing up anything or using paper again. And we probably use much more paper now than we did when I was growing up. So I think that there's always going to be a demand for you know, high-tech medicine and it's a uh, rapidly growing field with great potential and radiology is really on the forefront of that. And at, when it gets to a point, if it gets to a point that the computer is really replacing us, it will really be replacing all specialties and, and you know, and all, and, and other professions as well. So it's not radiologists, it's when it gets to that point, it's everybody. Then as a society, we will need to stop and think, and okay, so how do we deal with that? I, I haven't thought about that for a while, but um, I think there are two things. Um, I think uh, the mentors that you meet, it has a big role to play. Um, if you take a step back, it has a big role to play in terms of what specialty you choose in general. And then once you're in that specialty, you know, which perhaps personalities do you um, get along with? Um, and so you naturally then start to get more interesting in sort of the work that they're doing. And so for me, I'm an abdominal imager, so I'm interested in the liver, the spleen, the pancreas, the pelvic organs as well. And so I got a lot of good mentorship in this program, uh, particularly from those set of attendings. And then there's just this quality where I would just go to the reading room every day and I would just love to read that body part. And I loved it a lot more than anything else. And it's something that I can't quite articulate yet. Um, so there's that aspect of it as well. To me, radiology, one step back, radiology as opposed to other uh, cardiology or uh, pulmonology. Radiology, I got to see a little bit of everything and I, and I act that. As I was rotating as a medical student through cardiology, oh, this is great. Then again, pulmonology and pediatrics and OB. I liked a little bit of everything. And one of the aspects of radiology that there were others, but one of the aspects of radiology is that I was able to see a little bit of everything. And then within radiology, I saw that we, actually we subspecialized too, but with beads, I could still see a little bit of everything. I think that when I was coming up through residency and medical school, there was a lot less technology um, being used for pediatric um, radiology. So 
I felt that it wasn't as cutting edge as adult. Now that's not necessarily the same now, but that's what it was then. So that's what sort of geared me more toward um, uh, doing adults. As far as radiology compared to other um, subspecial or specialties, um, to me it was like doing crossword puzzles. It was just fun. It was just that kind of mindset and that kind of um, um, interest with each an individual case. You had a problem, you had your vocabulary, which was your knowledge, you solved the problem and then you moved on. So it was sort of smaller chunks of information and multiple puzzles all day that you could be doing rather than one, you know, more long and involved um, involvement in one particular issue. Um, I think a lot of my choices for my career were um, luck and circumstance. Um, going through medical school, I thought I wanted to be a surgeon, I thought I wanted to be a pediatrician, I thought I wanted to be an OBGYN, but I, when I went through the um, rotations, I sort of ruled them out for various reasons. And um, I remember rotating through radiology, which was a complete mystery for me. And um, the radiologists were generally happy. The attendings were much happier than, say, my OBGYN in the middle of the night while we were waiting for a delivery. And um, it was a challenge, and so I decided to um, choose that as my um, residency. I was, and I was lucky that I did. And I'm a breast imager, and at the time when I was choosing my fellowship and what I wanted to subspecialize in, there weren't a lot of breast imaging, uh, breast imaging fellowships, and breast imaging was just an emerging um, subspecialty. And so I decided to do that because, again, it was something that um, was not very popular at the time and um, just caught my interest. And now it's a very popular subspecialty, and I'm very fortunate that it went this way. Yeah, and then um, in your residency, you get a bit of a taster of every specialty that you uh, that is available, and some of those you may loathe. I loathed interventional radiology, so which it is, <laughs> but I really liked pediatric radiology. So then you go into the specialty that you actually like. You will have a different flavour because now interventional radiology is its residency all in itself. So Julius can comment on that, but. Um, other than interventional radiology, then you can get a taste of all the specialties while you're a resident, and then you can choose the fellowship that fits with you. Yeah, so before I uh, even thought about interventional radiology, actually, my very first step in uh, medicine was cardiovascular so thoracic surgery. Very big mistake. So uh, thank God I didn't do it because I realized that all the people there are very, very unhappy and work very long hours. And uh, um, for me, um, the pathway into radiology actually started in research because I um, started doing a PhD and wanted to understand how things work and I uh, realized that um, as a medicine doctor or as a surgeon you can fix certain problems but you never really have a deeper look inside and then I got fascinated with diagnostic radiology but then somewhat uh, realized that I would miss the component of actually diagnosing something seeing something but then doing something about it yourself hands-on and um, today, interventional radiology um, um, combines both specialties. So first and foremost, uh, you definitely have to be a good diagnostic radiologist because the specialty needs that as a foundation and cannot survive without it. And then you do uh, uh, those hands-on <coughs> skills and you treat your uh, patients and you follow them like a, a real clinician. Uh, and you own your patient and sometimes you can own a disease. My special interest is liver cancer. And um, it's a very technological field uh, that I actually like so you can do machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence, you can do molecular imaging research, and you can do interventions on patients. So to me, interventional radiology, and specifically liver interventions, seem so interesting because you can combine diagnostic skills, you can do hands-on stuff and follow your patients like a clinician, but still have a, this deep introspection of what's going on. And I think that um, very few specialties offer that, and I think radiology in general and interventional is, um, has a special role in this, so that got me excited. I like nuclear medicine because it's basically um, a little bit of everything. Um, <clears throat> we image children, adults, we see patients, we treat patients, um, and we look at imaging. Um, to me, it's just sort of like the oh, like a tapas. <laughs> it's a little bit of everything, and I really um, I'm never bored. Um, I'm always interested in what I'm doing. I, when I, I, I always knew I really liked radiology, but I never wanted to give up um, kind of having patients, seeing patients, and um, kind of 
communicating with them and feeling like I had some sort of impact on them. And um, in nuclear medicine, I definitely feel that way. Um, you know, we treat um, prostate cancer, um, metastases, um, we treat thyroid conditions, and I always have that kind of connection with patients without, um, I think, maybe the tedious work of like managing diabetes, which I think is fantastic if you're able to do it. It's just, you learn who you are in medical school. And I think um, that's what leads you to sort of, you know, what you want to do. So typically our daily routine is uh, coming either here to the hospital or to one of our satellite offices. Starting about 8 a.m. or so, we arrive and there's a, there's a list of uh, studies that have been performed, let's say, overnight and have not been read yet. So we read those studies. And throughout the day, more studies will come. Clinicians will come through the door saying, hey, sister, can we review that MRI that, uh, that you read yesterday? Or that was just done, we review with them. Uh, other clinicians will come and say, hey, uh, let's round and go through all the studies that our patients in the ICU, for example, had in the last 24 hours. So they give me the clinical input, I give them the imaging input, and then we try to work out what is going on with the patient. Then uh, an ultrasound tech will come and show me a study and I'll say, hey, let me, let me review this. I'll go with them to the room, I'll scan the patient myself. Uh, parents will often ask me what's going on and I'll discuss with them what's going on. Then uh, I think I'll stop and empty my bladder. <laughs> <laughs> then, uh, then I'll go to a, to a multidisciplinary uh, conference where, for example, a tumor board where there will be two or three patients that will be presented, and there will be lots of different specialists. There will be a, an oncologist, a, uh, a surgeon, uh, someone from radiation oncology, someone from pathology, and we'll present that patient, and all together we'll decide uh, what to do next. So it's really a lot of different things. And then at about 5 p.m., if I'm lucky and I'm on top of my list, I'll go home. And then between 5 p.m. and 8 a.m. next morning, someone in our group would be on call. If there's a need, they would be, they would be called. Then often we can uh, figure out things from home, in our computer at home. But if it's a procedure, for example, we'll drive to the hospital, do the procedure, go back home, and next morning is the same. My day is not that dissimilar. Um, we usually get in about eight. I do only ultrasound, so we have texts coming in for every single case all day long. Our department, usually with three attendings, does about 150 cases a day. And um, it's, it's interesting because our texts are very knowledgeable and they're very bright and they come in and they present a case and they show us their findings. And you know we look at it and we appreciate the art of it and we appreciate the, um, the skill of it. And then if there are any questions that the tech has or are there are any questions that we have or if we want to evaluate something different, we'll go in and talk to the patient and add, we'll go in and scan the patient and then ultimately talk to the patient and let them know what we um, saw. I'm doing um, specifically, a lot of my time is specifically for MSK ultrasound where I'll go in for every patient and after the technologist scans, I will scan because our technologists are being trained right now. And so in those cases, I spend a fair amount of time with the patients and I um, get to chat with them, I find out about everything that's going on, and then at the end, I give them their diagnosis. Um, we have residents and fellows with us um, almost all the time, so we're constantly teaching every case that comes through. We is either checked by one of us or a resident, and then we any check cases that were checked by the resident or fellow is reviewed with us, and um, we have an opportunity to teach the fellows informally, the fellows and the residents informally all day. Um, we also go to conferences, we give resident conferences, we give fellow conferences. Some of them are lectures, some of them are question and answer or board reviews, other ones are um, hands-on type of um, conferences. And um, basically it's a very, then we also have biopsies I should mention where we go in and we 
with what resident or fellow going and do a biopsy. Um, and we often have anywhere from one to four of those or five of those a day. So um, that's basically what we do. There's a lot of variability. Every day is different. And as someone mentioned before, we never get bored. There's always something. Actually, there's always 10 things happening <laughs> at one time. So it's very rewarding in that regard. So for me, every day is different. And usually the afternoon or the night before, I check my phone to see what I'm doing tomorrow. Um, my home base is here at um, Smiler Cancer, where I'm a breast imager. And even um, when I'm here, my responsibilities can be different. Some days I can just read screenings, which is a relatively quiet day, um, but busy, but steady. Um, I can be doing problem-solving mammography or diagnostic uh, mammography where a woman might feel a lump or has some issues and then I'm always uh, working them up and talking to them. Or I could be on biopsies where I could do, you know, between seven to ten biopsies throughout the day, including some emergency add-ons and just managing that and teaching residents and fellows. Um, in addition to working here, we have a lot of satellite offices that breast images, imaging covers in New Haven and Fairfield County. So. For example, yesterday I was working in Fairfield in a sort of a private practice-like setting um, without any trainees, and um, uh, so it's just really variable. On other days, I, have an I wear my administrative hat where I'm just dealing um, with various issues, clinical issues that other sections are having, um, scheduling issues, just a whole variety of different um, things, managing a large department um, and all of these satellite offices. And then when I have extra time, I also wear my academic hat, um, where I might be um, doing some research, journal reviews, um, book chapters, which I'm writing, and um, preparing also for CME conferences. So I do, as an academic radiologist, I do get invited to um, sometimes mundane places to give lectures, but also sometimes um, sort of more interesting places, um, so it gives you an excuse to travel. So recently I was invited to go to Brazil, so I'll be going there in October. <coughs> I'm going to Mexico, not Cancun, but in a nice place in January for um, a CME conference. So it's, sort of, it's, it's really quite um, a variety of things that I do, so it makes it interesting. Yeah, and I mean, I do what Cicero does. Um, I, I think I'd, I'd uh, emphasize that other than actually dealing with a patient and, uh, and making a diagnosis on a child, the next most fulfilling part of being a clinical radiologist, I think, is the is the dialogue you have with your physician colleagues. So the clinicians come down, you are able to help them make their diagnoses. You can really impress them by showing them things that they haven't noticed or things that they haven't put together as part of uh, their workup of a patient by going over the images with them. And physicians love this as well. It's not as if um, uh, they find this a drag. They, they really value the the interaction they have with radiologists who nine times out of ten actually make the diagnosis for them and help them come to the conclusion as to what they need to do. So I think that part of the job is uh, can't be um, uh, uh, overemphasized. And then to follow on from Regina, yes, the time off that you have, you know, we, we in an academic center you have some administrative, some uh, at some research time, and you can use that for the things that uh, Regina spoke about. We also allow faculty um, uh, to do uh, other things during their admin time. They can do MBAs, they can do D uh, MPhils, they can do other degrees as part of uh, their clinical work. And um, this is something that I think can really uh, augment your <coughs> professional satisfaction, being able to do these additional training. Although well, you're probably a bit jaded about training already, just starting. But <laughs> training never ends. I did an MBA two years ago, so I'm afraid training never ends. And uh, you have that ability in radiology too. And I'd like to talk to you both about a clinical day in IR as well as a research day, uh, since I'm sort of doing both those. So, clinical day in IR, for example, begins with a meeting of all IR faculty and trainees uh, discussing the case depot, all the case requests that are put in the previous day by uh, clinicians, where you go through cases and decide whether or not this procedure or that procedure needs to be done A, urgently, and then how. Um, then there is uh, really exciting both teaching as well as grand round lectures, both in IR and I have to say DR teaching is fantastic. You have two hours of high level, actually Congress level, uh, really a, a teaching going on for all trainees here. Um, then once the morning conference is done, you essentially head over uh, to the procedure rooms on a, on a procedure day and then you essentially find patients that you have to consent and then you would do procedures on them. For example, you would use uh, radiofrequency ablation um, to uh, destroy a liver tumor 
with heat. And then the second procedure would be a procedure that uses minimally invasive catheters to reach a tumor and occlude the blood supply and inject chemotherapy under image guidance uh, in this tumor. And then you would, for example, have on a Thursday at 1 p.m. a liver tumor board where you um, attend and discuss with hepatologists, uh, surgeons, and other professions on you know certain cases, very complex cases, how um, you want you want like to treat them. And then in the afternoon, for example, you can uh, see patients in clinic where you have either follow-up or patients that come and you know who their first cancer diagnosis, and you would be the sometimes the first doctor to see them and the first doctor to evaluate them for certain therapies, and um, you can either. Uh, refer the patients to surgeons or sometimes surgeons or oncologists would refer them to you. So uh, this is what you would do um, on a clinical uh, day. As for research, that is pretty much everything, uh, whatever you want to do, you can do. Um, I am involved both in um, animal experiments and research. We have a huge animal research lab with actually clinical site scanners where we can both do interventions as well as uh, uh, scanning of animals, uh, different sizes from, from mice to, to, to larger animal models both with tumors as well as non-cancer uh, research. Um, you can have a lab meeting once a week and discuss with your research team what, uh, you know, what the next topics are. Um, you're also going a lot to research meetings and I think uh, the benefit here is also that the interdisciplinary Smilo Cancer Center offers fantastic teaching that you can attend uh, throughout your career. And uh, yeah, so this is how a research day looks like. So <clears throat> my day depends on whether I'm on general nuclear medicine or head CT. Um, if I'm on head CT, it's a pretty um, sort of predictable day of reading head CTs, um, teaching residents. Um, if I'm on general nuclear medicine, it's sort of uh, kind of like being a short order cook in a way. There are several imaging rooms and you're kind of thinking about things as they're happening. Um, is the gallbladder showing up? Do I have to order morphine? Um, is this bone scan, does this really warrant a SPECT CT for further evaluation? Um, you get a call for um, an inpatient study, is it really indicated? Um, so, you know, there are lots of things going on um, throughout the day, um, including the um, tumor board conferences, which are usually in the morning and in the afternoon. And, um, and then once a week we have a clinic where we um, have patients who are going to be treated uh, with radioactive iodine. Um, and it's, it's just sort of um, interesting, kind of unpredictable. variable. Um, I'm a breast imager, so we uh, have a clinic where we interact with patients all day long. So very many of our patients, we give um, the, their diagnosis directly, and it can be as simple as your mammogram today, your routine mammogram is normal. Um, other times it can be that it's abnormal and we need to do a biopsy, and um, breast imaging is uh, attractive because we are multimodality. We do MAMA, which is x-ray based, ultrasound, MRI and we also do procedures, and we have patients running all day. And so there's a lot, oh yeah, so there's a lot of variety. Um, we will on occasion give patients a diagnosis that they do have breast cancer. Um, that's frequently on the phone, sometimes it's in person. Um, we work very closely with our breast surgeons and other referring physicians to um, best manage how to communicate these um, you know, more serious res results with the patients. I think uh, in general, uh, radiology is moving towards having more direct um, uh, um, communication with patients. Um, you know, we have it with IR, we have it with nuclear medicine, PEDS is doing it more, and I think that that's the direction that our subspecialty is going. In ultrasound, it's a very similar thing. It, many times we go in and scan our patients ourselves, either because we want to see something or the techs need our help. And whenever I go into a room to scan a patient myself, I tell them the results before. I leave. Um, and also, we also do biopsies, so we're very involved with the patient as far as that's concerned. So we have a fair amount, and truthfully, in ultrasound, you have the flexibility to be as involved as you choose. And that's the same in PEDS. We do ultrasound, too, and it's exactly the same, and we do some other procedures under fluoroscopy, for example. And the parents are there with the child, so they will 
asks us all what's happening, I'll tell him, look, I'll show you the images, let me, uh, let me go through it, and then we'll, I'll show you later. And I'll go through the images with them. Uh, whereas if I'm reading an X-ray or an MRI, chances are this will, be, this will be remotely, so I don't have contact with them. So there's a little bit of both. Yes, I think your question is pointing to is the patient contact in radiology. I haven't heard there's a significant patient contact from the IR attending that's seeing patients in clinic, from the nuclear medicine radiologist that's doing thyroid cancer treatment, pediatric radiologist, we tell parents, you know, your kid's got a kidney tumor when we finish doing the ultrasound. Regina calling cancer diagnoses through to patients directly. Lisa spending a long time looking at, uh, at uh, musculoskeletal ultrasounds and telling the patients exactly what's wrong with them. So there is a lot of uh, patient interaction in radiology, and that's a sort of rumor that we sit in a dark room all day, and uh, <laughs> we do spend some time in a dark room, but there's tons of patient contact as well. And we're a pretty affable bunch, and I think uh, we do it pretty well, actually. Say two of our two of our patient communication trainees in this hospital who train all the physicians and all the all the nurses are radiologists. So that tells you that uh, they were picked for being good communicators. So we're not all moles in the dark. <laughs>
we uh, we go to like Rob was describing, we go to some uh, centers in uh, some low resource centers and we uh, we educate radiologists there or general physicians. We also because because we are so. Uh, Radiology could potentially be reading from anywhere, right? All you need is an internet connection. So the same applies to you obtaining an image, let's say in uh, Cambodia, and sending that image to, let's say, the United States. So we have radiologists uh, in, in different parts of the globe that are part of a pool, all pediatric radiologists, that there are centers in a few countries that send us images, and we report today, and I say report in between quotes, because we're really uh, uh, we're uh, helping them. We're not like uh, it's a it's a pro bono thing. We're not charging anything, and uh, and it really seems to help. Like we have centers in uh, in Malawi, in uh, in Uganda, in uh, South Africa that, that we have helped in Laos, uh, Cambodia. Jamaica, so a bunch of different sites of uh, like low resource that they have at some point or are still doing, they send us images and we report to them. And that, uh, that again is very gratifying. So everyone's looking at me because uh, <laughs> um, being in uh, nuclear radiology, or, you know, read a lot of. Um, PET CT, and um, so I'm on the clinical side of things, um, I'm reading studies, you know, <coughs> patient studies, and um, patients who come to the hospital to get imaged. The PET Center is really um, a vehicle for research and a PET Center. Um, I don't personally interact with them too much, but um, they're more, uh, I think, into the basic science research and sort of industry trials. Yeah, there's a medical director for the for the research pet center that works with Emory, and uh, he combines clinical pet with research pet. Um, and you got interested in the research pet center? Is that why you're asking that question, or is it the clinical pet that you're interested uh, in? I guess I was doing. I was at the clinical center before here doing uh, fluorodeoxy glucose pet CT stuff. Right. So we we would see some of the radiologists, but mostly the pet department. But it seemed very close there. So I was wondering here, maybe there's, it seems that there's more of an emphasis on, on actually clinical than what I had seen uh, yeah. at the NIH. So yeah, our clinical PET scanners are for patients, mm -hmm. and our research PET scanners, which we're very lucky to have, are for research, and they do primates, they do animals, they do patients mm -hmm. as well. But if you have an interest in PET, this is the right place to be in, because PET is huge here. We do a massive amount of PET research. We've just did this big paper on synaptic density and, and uh, Alzheimer's disease which came out of Yale, so a lot of pet uh, imaging. 